I'm Tom Lusher, Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal, and I'm sitting here with uh, Joel Scalso, Chairman of Medicine uh, at Harvard Medical School and uh, Editor-in-Chief of uh, Circulation uh, at uh, the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, Joe just uh, presented the Paul Lichten Lecture, and we will talk a little bit uh, about uh, its content. Joe, thank you very much for coming. Welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. So, Joe, you talked about uh, personalized medicine in the broadest sense. Uh, don't we do this every day when we look at the patient, his age, his gender, and so on? Yes, I think the best physicians, uh, in fact, uh, personalize their decisions every day. They do so based on vast experience, personal experience, intuition, uh, a knowledge of what's available in the literature all combined. I think the difference between personalized medicine from the perspective of personal practice and personalized medicine that's now become institutionalized, at least in concept, around novel therapies is that the latter now begins to put some uh, evidence-based structure to the personalization. So the, the first examples, and you talked about cardiovascular medicine, obviously, as a cardiologist, but the first good examples of that are probably in different fields of medicine, like on oncology, isn't it? Yes, I think oncology has been well ahead of us in this regard, in part because we know a lot more about how to determine the molecular drivers for various oncological diseases. We know that there are mutations in many of these in very specific oncological diseases. And we have a growing pool of therapies that can target some of these mutant enzymes and proteins so that uh, not all melanomas are the same, not all breast cancers are the same, using the molecular markers that we understand the function of and how they are different in each melanoma or breast cancer gives us a more personalized view of how that tumor is behaving in a given individual. So can we apply this to cardiovascular medicine as well? I think, I think we can. Uh, I think it's still in its early phases as to how we best do that. Um, I think to a certain extent uh, we, we do it indirectly as we begin to refine our understanding of, for example, the lipoprotein profile that a patient may have. That's a step toward personalization, um, beginning first with distinguishing LDL from HDL cholesterol and now beginning to sort out some of the molecular determinants and biological variants that drive increased LDL levels or drive lower HDL levels give us a more personalized view of the overall lipid profile. And uh, in, 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 not, in the not too distant future, I think we'll be able to do the same thing for vascular calcification, uh, perhaps for endothelial function and blood pressure control. Uh, these are uh, much less developed than in cancers, uh, but I think that they, are, uh, they have great promise. So basically, the concept uh, comes from the genotype to the phenotype. And if you say that, you know, they're different melanomas, maybe they are different infarctions as well, and they may have different mechanisms. And is this an approach where we could uh, advance in some way or another? Uh, absolutely. I, one uh, paradigm I like to use is to uh, consider, for example, in the case of acute coronary syndromes, distinguishing patients based on their intermediate pathophenotypes, which is uh, to say the mechanisms that underlie uh, all diseases like inflammation, thrombosis, and fibrosis. Um, in our personal experiences, we've had lots of patients with acute coronary syndromes who may be more prothrombotic than others. Some may be more vasospastic than others. Some may be more calcified than others. And being able to distinguish among those different subsets would, be able, would lead us to be able to refine better the clinical trials that might focus on uh, some of those specific subsets more carefully and thoughtfully. So how can we improve uh, phenotyping in, in cardiovascular medicine? Is this uh, through imaging or is it the biochemical route? What, what do you think? That, that, that's, I think, the most essential question that we need to answer as we personalize uh, cardiovascular medicine more. And uh, the, the, the adjective that's commonly used is exquisite, exquisite phenotyping. How do we begin to improve, quantify, and more narrowly define the phenotype? And it include, doing so includes all of the, of the facets that you mentioned, from better clinical phenotyping, better imaging, uh, more rigorous molecular phenotyping, uh, genome-wide association studies, uh, uh, each of these and others uh, that are uh, 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 said to be orthogonal to those phenotypes may also be important, such as 
looking at inflammatory or fibrotic responses in other organs. How might that inform an inflammatory or fibrotic response mm -hmm. in a heart that's undergoing infarction or failure? Right. So you talked a lot about the, the networks of different molecular pathways, and if you show the entire network in our body, it is extremely complex. So how can we uh, address this complexity to make it clinically meaningful? The, uh, I think that, that, is, that is the challenge to uh, this new field of network medicine. How Once we have gathered all the elements of a network and assembled the network, it is extraordinarily complex. And our purpose as people who focus on disease is to identify those portions of the network which drive the disease phenotype, to reduce the network to a tractable size that can then give us potential drug targets that can influence the disease as the network drives it. So many trials that were negative in the past possibly have addressed the marker rather than a, a causal pathway. How can we avoid this in the future? Well, um, one way to, to do so is to, um, is to avoid the, uh, the, the uh, propensity we all have to link to a really exciting association that might be made from a small trial or from a rigorous epidemiology study, recognizing that associations are rarely causal and that we should be a little more measured in our response to even the most exciting new associations and begin to dissect mechanisms before we design a trial around it. You talked a lot about this microRNAs, and this is an exciting topic in vascular biology right now because they are regulating lots of targets and therefore could also be uh, uh, screws where we can adjust the system potentially potentially, of course, also have a lot of side effects. Uh, so how do you perceive this in this context? Well, uh, it, is, it is true that they are easy to manipulate and becoming easier to manipulate in vivo and reasonably safely, at least over the short term and early trials. I think the caution uh, that we need to exercise is uh, ensuring that the targets that we're most interested in are the primary targets and the off-target effects, the other potential messenger RNA targets that we don't really want to perturb, are not terribly perturbed. It may be that we can tweak the sequence of these microRNAs enough to improve their selectivity. That's one strategy. However we do it, though, will require that we know the complete network of targets and be able to measure the network of targets to ensure that we're only focusing or principally focusing on the targets of particular interest for a disease. One example uh, uh, for this uh, problem is, of course, uh, uh, the trials now on the cholesterol ester transport protein inhibitors. And the first one, torcetropib, did indeed have unforeseen uh, off-target effects on aldosterone secretion, endothelin secretion, and of course, in turn, blood pressure, while other molecules that supposedly were the same did not have such an effect or not to the, sa the same degree. Uh, how can we address such uh, uh, problems in the future? Do you think we can ever predict this based on uh, bioinformatics and the pathways uh, that we're analyzing? The hope is that we will. And in fact, in that particular area, as I mentioned in the talk today, in the CETP inhibitors, just such an analysis was performed by Xie and colleagues in San Diego. And they were able, using a network approach, to distinguish torcetropib from the other members of this drug class mm. as uniquely able to activate the renal angiotensin system, uh, which, uh, as others have recognized, is uh, uh, likely at least a partial explanation for its uh, adverse effects. So it, 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 what it really means, it's a perfect example of how the pharmaceutical industry needs to be more rigorous in looking at the expansive potential of the uh, other actions that a drug might have besides the target of interest. Now, in evidence-based medicine that uh, Solom Yusuf, who was also in a, in a meeting and discussed uh, uh, with you, um, uh, are performing, these are really the contrary of what we're just discussing. You, you, you do a trial with 20,000 or even in hypertension 40,000 patients. They're all different and we just randomized them to one strategy. And the, looking back in history, we got pretty far with that. Um, so do you think we should change this approach? Should we redesign trials in the future, do them completely differently than we did it so far? 
Well, I think at least in the cardiovascular field, we've gotten about as far as we can with this large population-based approach. We're looking at average effects distributed uh, generally in a normal way for some of the parameters we measure like blood pressure. Uh, and we're missing uh, people at both ends of that distribution. Um, a, a very good analogy is one that one of my hematology colleagues shared with me uh, who pointed out that if we felt that uh, liver extract and the B12 in it was a good treatment for a certain kind of anemia, but we couldn't distinguish that certain kind of anemia from all other anemias, and we gave liver extract to everyone who had anemia, we never would, be, would have been able to pick up the signal that was specific to B12 deficiency and megaloblastic anemia. We really needed to use the biomarkers that define megaloblastosis to be able to hone down on a smaller population that would be responsive. And I would say the very same uh, issue pertains to hypertension trials, to heart failure trials, to acute coronary syndrome trials, where we just haven't been smart enough to find out what the markers are that segregate the subgroups yet. Yes, uh, salt is an issue where, where this uh, could be looked at uh, ex in an excellent fashion because some people, when you lower salt, they actually increase blood pressure, yes. a, very, a small minority. Right. Some do respond, some don't respond. And so to, to implement it to the society as, a, at large uh, seems a bit stupid. I mean, it's not very selective, not very personalized. Yes. And so we will see uh, lots of changes and uh, you stimulated our thoughts. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you.